Hello everyone, I'm JT, and this is Women on Death Row. Today, for episode 14, we're going to talk about Susan Eubanks from California. As with every episode in this series, I'm going to cover this case using primary documentation. Any sources used are going to be in the show notes. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, hit that notification button, and we'll let you know when new videos are published or when we go live. This is the cheapest and easiest way to support us. Just as an added warning, again, these cases described in this series will contain difficult topics and really detailed descriptions of assault, violence towards children or other adults, torture, and more. Much of the information comes directly from court documents and is based in fact. While this includes the hard stuff, it's important to understand the hard stuff to understand the crime. Please, please continue cautiously. And with that, let's get into it. Suzanne, Susan Diane Eubanks was born on June 26, 1964 in California. Eubanks married and divorced multiple times, and her relationships were often characterized, unfortunately, by domestic violence, substance abuse, and financial difficulties. These factors contributed to a highly unstable home life for her and her four sons, Brandon, 14, Austin, 7, Brigham, 6, and Matthew, 4. Eubanks had a history of depression and substance abuse, which worsened over the years. She struggled to cope with the pressures of raising her children, managing relationships, and dealing with financial strain. The following comes from People v. Eubanks, Number S082915. At the time defendant killed her children, she had been living with them, her boyfriend, Renee Dodson, and her nephew in a small home in San Marcos. Defendant and her first husband, John Armstrong, had one son, Brandon. Following her divorce from Armstrong, defendant married Eric Eubanks. She was pregnant at that time with Austin, the child of Larry Shoebridge, with whom she had been living. Eric fathered two of the defendant's sons, Brigham and Matthew. After defendant's brother died, the defendant also obtained custody of her nephew. Each son, each son had been shot in the head by the same five-shot shot, 38 caliber revolver. At the time of their deaths, Austin and Brigham had .02 micrograms of Xanax in their blood, while Brandon and Matthew had none. In the living room, the defendant had put the revolver to the temple of 14-year-old Brandon and shot him. She also shot him in the neck from a few inches away. She shot her younger sons in their bedroom. With the revolver no more than a foot from Austin's head, she shot her 7-year-old son. With the gun inches from Brigham's head, she shot her 6-year-old son twice. With the gun close to the head of the 4-year-old Matthew, she shot him as well. She fired other bullets in the bedroom that hit a wall and a window. At some point in the bedroom, the defendant opened the revolver cylinder, removed the five expended shell casings, put them in a trash can, and reloaded the five-shot revolver. The defendant shot herself in the abdomen with that same revolver. Her six-year-old nephew at, was home at the time of the shootings. He was found unharmed, in bed, with the blankets pulled up to his chin. Deputies who entered the home shortly after the shooting found five notes on the defendant's bedroom floor, all in the, in the defendant's handwriting. One was to Eric. The defendant wrote, quote, You betrayed me, you kept a diary, and you and Renee Dodson conspired against me. She added, quote, I've lost everyone I've ever loved. Now it's time for you to do the same. She said he could use any money from her worker's disability case to, quote, bury the kids and find your rainbow. Anna May, I'm sure. In a note to Dodson, defendant wrote he was, quote, the biggest liar to date that I know. Stay on crystal meth and let your 37-year-old ass move back with mom and dad. Get back with Pam and or Sherry. They're your class. It concluded, quote, see ya, ha ha. A third letter was to Brandon's father. It said, quote, I know you'll hate me forever, 
but I can't let Brandon live without his brothers, so I did what I did. She wrote she had been, quote, strong for 25 years, and I'm tired of all the fight and hurt. She ended the note by complaining that Dodson, quote, fucked me all up. Defendant also wrote to her niece and her sister apologizing for her actions. To the niece, defendant explained, quote, I know what I'm doing is going to hurt you tremendously, but I can't and have no desire to go on. To her sister, the defendant wrote she was, quote, tired of being strong, that things are way out of hand. Defendant included Matthew's birth date and hers and asked her sister to ensure the two of them would be in the same casket. Besides the evidence of the crimes themselves and the above-described notes, the prosecution presented the following evidence regarding events that preceded the crimes. The Eubanks marriage had appeared stable until defendant experienced job-related injuries that required surgery. She then began to abuse prescription medications and alcohol. She lost her job, and she and her husband Eric began a recurring pattern of separation and reconciliation. The police found more than 50 bottles of prescription medications in defendant's house after the murders. In the fall of 1997, the Eubankses were going through a divorce, and Eric moved out of their South Twin Oaks home about one month before the murders. Defendant and Renee Dodson had had an intimate relationship on and off since they met in 1994. Dodson moved into defendant's house after Eric moved out. From October 13th to 19th, Dodson left defendant's house, and Eric moved back in. A short time later, Eric moved out, and Dodson returned. About ten days before the murders, the defendant purchased replacement deadbolt locks for her house. Appearing angry, she told a clerk who knew Dodson that he had broken the lock on her door, and she was buying new ones so she could not enter or get his effing stuff. Defendant told the clerk to warn Dodson that she just purchased bullets at a nearby store, and one, quote, had his name on it. Defendant then asked one of the little boys with her, quote, Mommy did buy the bullets, didn't she? Didn't she? Dodson testified defendant previously had commented that, if pushed, she would kill her children and herself. The afternoon of October 26, the day of the murders, Brandon stayed home to watch his siblings and defendant's nephew while defendant and Dodson went to a bar to watch football. The couple ordered a pitcher of beer and soon were joined by another couple. Defendant did not want the woman to sit with them due to a confrontation they had when she had criticized defendant for talking about Dodson behind his back. Dodson decided he and the defendant should go to a different bar because the defendant was upset. Defendant argued with Dodson when they left, complaining he had taken the other woman's side. She slapped Dodson a few times while he was driving. Dodson then decided to drive home. When defendant realized they were not going to another bar, she slammed the minivan into its parking gear while they were traveling 30 miles per hour on a freeway off-ramp. The defendant removed the keys from the ignition, but Dodson eventually was able to retrieve them and drive home. Once home, the couple continued to argue in their bedroom. When Dodson said he wanted to leave and move to Hawaii, the defendant slapped him, took his keys, blocked his exit from the room, and ripped out the telephones. Eventually, they calmed down and had sex. Dodson then said he was going to watch television in the living room. Instead, when the defendant was in another part of the house, Dodson ran to a nearby gas station, called the sheriff's department, and asked that they send a deputy to stand by so he could retrieve his belongings and truck from the defendant's house. While the defendant and Dodson were fighting, Brandon had gone to a pay telephone and called Kathy Goobs, the mother of his best friend. He asked her to come and get him and the other boys because his brothers were scared and Brandon did not want them exposed to the fighting. Kathy told Brandon to go home, reassess the situation, and to call again if he still needed her to pick them up. A short time later, defendant called Kathy, pleading for Kathy to come take the boys. Kathy testified that she spoke to the defendant, who, though upset and agitated, did not sound intoxicated. Defendant said she feared Dodson would call the police, and that if they came, they would take and separate the children. Kathy agreed to pick up the boys, but she never left to get them. 
Kathy had been allowing Eric to stay at her home until he found a place to live. She decided not to get the boys because she was concerned the defendant no longer would allow Brandon to visit her son if defendant saw Eric at Kathy's house when the defendant came to retrieve the boys because she would think Kathy was taking sides. Deputy Sheriff Daniel Dees picked up Dodson at the gas station. As they approached the defendant's house, defendant was carrying Dodson's tools away from his vehicle, which had two flat tires and broken headlights. When Dees told defendant to drop the tools, she became confrontational and claimed Dodson owed her money and had raped her. She went inside after Dees threatened to arrest her. While Dodson was pull- putting his tools in the patrol car, the defendant came outside yelling, I've been screwed by men my whole life. I've been beaten. I've been raped. As Dodson left with Dees, they saw Eric parked nearby. Kathy had paged Eric and advised him of the calls from defendant and Brandon, and Eric had come to check on the children. He saw the police car and was waiting for it to drive away because defendant had a restraining order against him. After learning that the defendant was throwing Dodson out, Eric agreed to take Dodson to a bar in Escondido. They loaded the tools into Eric's truck and left. Back inside her house, the defendant telephoned Brandon's grandfather and then called Armstrong in Texas. She told Armstrong the police had been there investigating the incident with her boyfriend, in which she had slashed his tires, broke his windshields, and put sugar in his gas tank, and that she feared Child Protective Services would come to take the children. She said she needed Armstrong to tell Brandon to, quote, stick by me on this one, even if it means lying. When Eric arrived at Kathy's home after 6 p.m., he had her listen to a voicemail he just received in which the defendant simply said, Say goodbye. At 6.30 p.m., Eric called the sheriff's office and asked to speak with Deputy Deese. About 7 p.m., the two connected. When Eric mentioned the message and his concern that the defendant had a handgun at the house, Deese instructed him to request a welfare check of defendant's residence. The defense presented evidence through the testimony of Dr. Clark Smith, who was board certified in addiction and forensic psychiatry, and that the fact defendant received infusions of saline and other fluids while in the ambulance would have affected the alcohol content of the blood drawn from her at the hospital, although that blood sample revealed a 0.07% blood alcohol content, and the toxicologist had calculated that defendant's blood alcohol content at the time of the murders was 0.09%. Dr. Smith testified defendant's blood alcohol content at the time of the murders would have been closer to 0.19%. He testified the infusions given to the defendant similarly would have affected the level of Valium found in her blood. He opined that the alcohol and drug levels in defendant's um, blood at the time of the shooting would have produced a, quote, very significant effect on her brain and would have affected her emotions, perceptions, judgment, and other higher brain functions. Dr. Vina Spieler, the toxicologist who had estimated the defendant's blood alcohol content was 0.09% at the time of the murders, was called as a rebuttal expert witness to refute Dr. Clark's conclusions. Dr. Spieler testified that she had based her calculations on formula published in recognized literature in that she formed her opinion that liquid intravenous infusions into the body do not affect blood alcohol or drug concentrations in the manner claimed by Dr. Smith based on literature on dilutions and her personal experience while working at the coroner's office. Crime scene reconstructionist Rod Englert testified an expert testified as an expert that the defendant first shot Brandon, next shot Austin, then fired in the direction of Matthew but missed. Engler testified the defendant reloaded her revolver at that point and then shot Brigham twice, fired a shot between Brigham and Matthew, and then shot Matthew once. Larry Shoebridge testified that an old girlfriend contacted him in 1989 while he and the defendant were romantically involved in living together. The defendant responded by putting a gun to Shoebridge's head and saying she, quote, could do whatever she wanted and she could have killed him. Shoebridge decided to leave. Fearing defendant's reaction to his decision, he moved out after she had gone to work. After the defendant discovered where Shoebridge was living, she drove up to his house. Defendant screamed at Shoebridge and tried to attack his female friend. 
the defendant eventually ro- drove off, screeching her tires. Brandon's relatives and a friend testified about the impact Brandon's death had on their lives. The paternal grandmother mentioned two incidents in which she believed defendant had abused Brandon. Teachers and coaches testified about the impact the boy's deaths had on them. Linda Smith, the defendant's sister, testified regarding a telephone call she received from the defendant in which the defendant said she, had, she once had rubbed her nephew's face in a dirty diaper after she learned he had hidden the diaper behind his bed. When Smith became angry with her, the defendant changed her story and said she had only made her nephew smell the diaper as punishment. The defense presented evidence that defendant's mother and stepfather were alcoholics who fought constantly and had affairs. Defendant's mother abused her by slapping her and dragging her by her hair. The defendant's mother died in a house fire when defendant was eight years old. Defendant w- then was rotated among relatives, including an aunt who abused her and a relative who managed a hotel and had defendant and her siblings clean its rooms. The defendant sometimes lived with her stepfather in a trailer where he would get drunk and urinate on himself. The defense presented testimony from relatives and the defendant's co-workers that the defendant's number one concern was her children, that she was proud of them and very caring, that she was an excellent employee, and that she did well in the courses she took to become a medical office insurance biller after becoming disabled from a job-related back injury. (coughs) Relatives and her friends who testified that defendant was tortured during her childhood and that she was a loving parent asked the jury not to impose the death penalty. The children's former pediatrician testified the defendant regularly brought her sons to him for checkups and medical problems. Eric Eubanks testified about his marriage and family life with the defendant. He said he still had some love feelings for her. A correctional consultant testified the defendant would not be a future danger if sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. In 1999, Susan Eubanks was sentenced to death. Her case has since undergone numerous appeals, but despite these, the California Supreme Court has upheld her conviction and death sentence. Thank you for tuning in to Women on Death Row. If you found this content interesting, you can find all this and more on the True Crime and Wine Time YouTube channel, as well as in the Courtyard Discord server. Click on the Discord invite link in the show notes and get ready for case files, game nights, daily streaming, and a fantastic community. Until next time, you take care of yourself, your friends, your family, your community. Don't let anybody dull that sparkle. And shine on, you crazy diamonds. Shine on.